The objectives for this video are, firstly, to understand the essential components of a scientific measurement. The reason this is important is because if you think of scientific theory as a building, scientific measurement is the foundation. It's the foundation on which all scientific theory is based. And so we really have to understand how scientific measurements work if we expect to be able to argue scientific theory and understand how scientific theory is constructed for measurements. Our second goal is to write measurements using scientific notation and understand how to convert between measurements that use scientific notation and measurements that use prefixes. The reason we use scientific notation is because scientific measurements span a huge range. They span what we call orders of magnitude, 10 to the first power, 10 to the second power, all the way up to 10 to the 23rd power, and they go the other direction as well, 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 12 or 15. And these astronomically huge and unbelievably small numbers would take up a lot of space if we wrote them just as regular numbers. So we use scientific notation to represent really, really large and really, really small scientific measurements. And the third goal is to identify the accuracy and precision of measurements. And this is important when we talk about measurement quality. So is a measurement a good measurement? Well, there are a couple of different ways to think about this. And accuracy and precision really encapsulate the quality of a measurement. Is it good or not? Well, there are two dimensions to that. We'll talk about both in this video. Let's begin discussing scientific measurements. So I've written up here a simple scientific measurement, 4.018 m, where m stands for meters. We can break this down into two components that are shared by all scientific measurements. The first is the number itself. We'll call this the value of the measurement. And the second, the letter m, refers to meters and represents the units of the measurement. We can think of every scientific measurement as being composed of a value and of units, and each of these answers a particular question. The units are associated with the question, what phenomenon belongs to this measurement? What phenomenon is measured by the measurement? In the case of 4.018 meters, meters is a unit of length, and so the measurement represents the phenomenon of length. The second question is, how much of that phenomenon is expressed by the measurement? Here, 4.018. Meters is the quantity of length encapsulated by this measurement. So this is fairly straightforward. Every scientific measurement contains a value and units that answer the questions, what phenomenon is being measured, and how much of it did we observe? As I mentioned, scientific measurements can span a very large range, so we use what's called scientific notation to represent very large and very small numbers. In fact, any number that's less than 1 or greater than 10 can be written in scientific notation. And the way we write scientific notation is shown for you here. We start with an initial factor that is between 1 and 10, and we multiply that by some power of 10. So the notation written here tells us to take the number 6.14 and multiply it by 10 to the third power, or 1,000, to arrive at the final measurement, which is 6,140. I want to take a look at one more measurement that's the one you see at the bottom here, 12.084 cm. The c, which is sitting in front of m for meters, is a prefix. It's the prefix centi, so the units here are centimeters. And in this case, the little c is an instruction that tells us to multiply by 10 to the negative 2, or 0.01. You should notice that the instruction dictated by c is very similar to the times 10 to the third that we saw above. In fact, we can think of scientific prefixes really as scientific notation in disguise. We're taking that times 10 to the third, and instead of writing that out, we're using a prefix that represents a more compact form of that instruction to multiply by some power of 10. So if we wanted to write this measurement using scientific notation to eliminate the prefix and just use meters, we would multiply the measurement by 10 to the negative 2 and convert to meters, which leads to 1.2804 times 10 to the negative 1 meters, where we shifted the decimal point to make 12.084 fit between 1 and 10, which meant we went from 10 to the negative 2 to 10 to the negative 1. Let's turn our attention now to talking about the quality of measurements. 
I want you to imagine that we're making a measurement, and the true value for this measurement is located at the center of this target that you see. We make a few experimental measurements in the course of an experiment, and these show up as x's, so they're not exactly the true value, they are the true or theoretical value plus some errors. We can associate a mean or an average value with the five black x's you see here, and that would show up approximately in the middle of the measurements, I've represented that here as a blue x. And when we talk about the quality of these measurements, there are two different ways to think about measurement quality. And the first involves comparing the mean of our measurements, which are all measurements of the same thing, we're just repeating the same thing many times, getting slightly different values, to the true or theoretical value that's at the center of the target. So in a sense, the length of this blue line that you see is a measure of what we call the accuracy of the measurement. That's a comparison between the true or theoretical value and the experimental mean, the mean of many measurements of the same thing, done many times just to illustrate that the experiment is reproducible. The length of that blue line reflects the error in the measurements, and specifically, it's a kind of error called systematic error. What we mean by systematic error is there's something wrong either with the experimental apparatus or with the theory itself that's leading to that true value. So you can imagine, of course, that there's something wrong with the apparatus that's pushing us away from the so-called true value, but on the other side, there could be something wrong with the true or theoretical value in the sense that our theory could be wrong. So systematic error comes from both instrumental or experimental or human errors and theoretical errors. Now let's turn our attention to a second sense in which we can talk about the quality of a measurement. So again I've laid down a couple of targets and at the center of these targets we can imagine the true or theoretical value. And again I'll lay down some black X's that show measurements that we've made and a blue X near the center to show the mean of these experimental measurements. We can talk about the spread or the distance of each individual experimental measurement from the mean. And this represents a different kind of metric of measurement quality. Notice that it doesn't refer to the true value at all. It's all about the difference between the individual measurements and the experimental mean. We call this metric precision, and its key feature is it's the difference between or a comparison between individual measurements and the experimental mean. Recall that when we talked about accuracy, we pinned any inaccuracy, any difference between the experimental mean and the true value on what we called systematic errors. The spread of the data that you see in imprecise measurements is a different kind of error. It's not systematic error that we can attribute to a single particular factor. It's more like random error. We can't know the source of spread of experimental data in the same way that we can understand the source of a systematic error. Random errors occur when many different factors are operating at the same time, the relative contributions are unknown to us, and in fact we can't know how much each contributes. So we can think of each of these little blue lines as a random error that causes the measurement to deviate from the experimental mean. Before I finish talking about precision, I want to give you a little test. See if you think the data I've drawn on the right-hand target is more or less precise than the data on the left-hand target.